But they're really funny. They they do all kinds. They they have very complicated social scene. You know, you heard pecking order. Well, there is a pecking order. There are chickens. Well, some chickens are dominant to other chickens. They all recognize each other, and they all know who's a dominant chicken. And it's really complicated and dynamic. It's it's very interesting. Socially, very interesting. Well, enough on uh, chicken dynamics. Um, any questions about the policy page? I think I, I think I may have typoed there. I think I left on a reference to homework from in the days when I actually had homework in this class. Ignore any reference to homework. There is no homework. You're just expected to know what you need to know when you come to lab. If you don't know, if there's something you can't figure out, ask. So are there any questions about lab one? So we're doing it this afternoon. My lab starts this afternoon. What time do I do it? 1.30. And I'll be leaving at 4.30. You don't have to leave. You can stay. Now, your cards hopefully will be activated by 4.30. So you can get back in. The... Uh, Patty assures me, she was sick earlier in the week, but yeah, she assures she just, came back today. just came back today, but she assures me that this is her top pri priority is to activate your cards. And so they should be good by this afternoon, which means you can come into the lab anytime you want over the weekend and work more on it. A couple of rules. One is don't prop the door open. If somebody pounds on the door, wants to get in, you don't let them in. If they're supposed to be there, they have a card. Now, the exception is, of course, if you recognize somebody from the class and they're dying outside the door and you look through the window and you recognize them, then okay. But if you're not completely sure that they're in the class, don't let them in. And the second thing is that uh, because some of the classes here don't let, allow students, the, the 2300 class wants control over when the students actually work. And so they don't want the students to have extra time in there because they want to know just exactly how many hours they're spending on, on projects. The second thing is no friends after hours. You, don't have, you can't have a friend come in and work in the lab. If they're not in the lab, if they're not in this class, they can't be in there. Find some of your friends in there, we will take your card access away. You won't be able to get in there anymore. So uh, uh, that, you know, there's the harshness there, but that's the way it goes. And uh, when you get to lab this afternoon, I'll give you the combination lock for the cabinets. I suppose I'd rather not have that on video note. So that's okay. That's all right. I'll do it this afternoon. And uh, so um, we'll do that and a few other sort of lab etiquette things this afternoon. Any questions about Lab 1? Again. we got a version of the code ready to go? Anybody compiled anything yet? This is a state machine. So you could, you could compile a state machine on Quartus and did you simulate it? No. Yeah, well. Anything else? Any questions about policy? Let's go back to code. I think I started on the on on a state machine um, on Friday. Friday, this is Friday. On Wednesday, that uh, implemented a 2D random walker, a 2D diffusion system. <clears throat> and I went through on Wednesday. I went through the kind of interface part of the of the Verilog that takes the that links your logic to the outside world. And I did want to say one more thing. We talked about VGA, we talked about SRAM. There's one more technology that you probably need to know before you before this will make sense. And that is how to generate a random number. Well there's a 
quote, who was it from, uh, I think, uh, Margolis, who said that anybody who uses arithmetic to generate a random number is, of course, in a state of sin. Uh, you can't generate a random number on a deterministic machine. But you can, you can generate bits that are awfully uncorrelated with each other. And there are different ways of doing this depending on the architecture that you're using. If you're using a big 32-bit microcontroller that with hardware, uh, hardware floating point, then a good way to do this is perhaps to use a uh, linear, linear congruent generator where you get a new random number for the cost of one multiply, one add, and a modulo operation which if you pick it carefully is just a, uh, a, a bit truncation. Okay. But we're not going to use that because um, arithmetic, while adds are cheap, multiplies are not cheap on this, on this uh, architecture. It takes real hardware multipliers. So we're going to use a different mechanism, mechanism called a linear feedback shift register, which uses some fairly long shift register and some set of bits, usually more than two, it doesn't, you have to have at least two, clearly. You're going to put these into an XOR and feed it back to the first bit and which two bits you choose depends on the length of the shift register, so I'm not going to specify those. There are tables. If you look up linear feedback shift register, you'll find tables of these things on courtesy of Google. And <clears throat> you get shifted out of here one random bit, one or zero, on every clock cycle. So if you needed a 16-bit random number, you'd have to shift 16 times. But for this particular application, where we're going to go left or right depending on, on one bit, and up and down depending on one bit, we're going to implement two shift registers, one for X and one for Y, and one is going to be 30 bits long, the other one is going to be 31 bits long. That's so you don't get repeating patterns very often because the least common multiple is enormous of the, of the shift register time. And they're cheap to implement because it only requires 30 logic elements to do the whole random number generator and it's fast. Later on in the semester we'll see how to efficiently generate longer bit streams, but for right now we only need one random bit per time step. So this is quite a, a nice way to do it in hardware. Okay, that's the last bit of infrastructure. <coughs> so what we're going to do is to start out by defining some, some signals that we need. We're going to define a reset signal. And the reset signal is going to be generated from a push button, which we'll do in a little while. We're going to define a register of 17 down to 0, which is going to be the address register for the for the SRAM and because I'm used to thinking in CPU terms I also defined a data register for 15 down to 0 because it's 16 bit return value from the uh, memory and all communication with the SRAM is going to go through these two registers There's a right enable line. And then we need to define a 
uh, some stuff for the state machine. I didn't know quite how many bits I was going, how many states I was going to need for the state machine, so I made a four, a four-bit state. Quartus is pretty smart. If you if you end up not using all of the bits of a of a of a variable of a signal, it just truncates the high order bits for you. So there's no huge penalty for specifying more bits than you need. I decided to drive seven of the LEDs. We need some fairly long registers, and the really nice thing about about L about uh, FPGAs is you can use whatever bit length happens to be handy. You don't have to stick with eight bits, sixteen bits, and thirty-two bits. If you need hundred and twenty-three bits, go for it. So in this case, I'm using thirty-one bits, and this is going to be the X random number. And then uh, another register of 28 down to 0 for Y Rand. Yes? It's 29 and 31. Well, I actually used 29 and 31, it turned out. I mean, this is the actual code, and before I was just sort of chatting. Um, we also need, uh, because we're. The style I like is I do everything I can in combinatorial logic and then assign the minimum state I possibly can to registers in a clocked section, in a, in a clocked assign. So <clears throat> we need a, a combinatorially determined x low bit and y low bit to hold the next value for x and y rand that is going to be shifted in at the end of this shift register. So this is the new low bit and the new x low bit and the new y low bit that are going to be shifted in on the next clock cycle after they've been calculated. Luke? Uh, is the reason that you made the two random registers different lengths so that they don't track? The yes, time? right. So they have different periods and so that you should the repeat time is the lowest common denominator of those. Then we're going to have a 9-bit position for the x value of the random walker and the y position of the random walker. So that limits us to <coughs> 5, 12 in each direction. But what I actually implemented was a 320 by 480 <coughs> raster, so 512 was is sufficient. Three, I'm sorry, 320 by 240, so 512 was sufficient. And we need a three down to zero for the sum. Why did I choose a? Four bit sum. I think it was because initially I was going to use, I was not only going to sum the four nearest neighbors to a pixel this way, but also this way. And so I still only needed three bits, but for some reason I coded four because I was going to sum the center one, which is nine. That's not necessary. So I really only needed two bits here, but the sum is going to be three. And we need a register which is going to be lock. It's going to be the lock bit which says whether or not we've <coughs> exceeded our luck factor and 
done a calculation during, uh, which was interrupted by the VGA operation. Any questions? Now, there is an I.O. bit I, I, didn't, I didn't put on the list yesterday, but you have to assign. It's TD reset. It's an I.O. line, and it has to be set to 1 binary 1. For reasons that escape me, if you don't do this, then you do not attach the 27 megahertz clock to the FPGA. And the VGA interface fails. <clears throat> so that's a static assignment. It's never going to change. You just assign it and leave it forever. <clears throat> Okay. So then there's a few module interfaces that are necessary. There are three modules that are supplied to you for this for this uh, project. One is reset delay. Another is the VGA underscore audio underscore PLL. So there's a reset delay. I'll write these all out and then I'll tell you why you need them. VGA underscore audio PLL phase lock loop and then there's VGA controller. The reset delay pauses the setup of the VGA after you press the reset button and it does it just a little bit and I believe that the reason for this, I haven't actually tried eliminating this, I believe it is not strictly necessary for the VGA but it is necessary for the audio interface because the audio codec state machine is so flaky. The audio codec state machine is a, it runs a separate chip from Wolfson systems and it has a tendency to ignore first commands and perhaps the reset delay helps that a little bit. Then the audio phase, the VGA audio phase lock loop sets two frequencies. It takes in 27 megahertz from the external clock and it puts out two frequencies. Phase lock loops can put out at least a couple of frequencies maybe more depending on the exact values that you ask for. But the audio phase lock loop in this case is going to put out 18 megahertz which goes to the audio codec and it puts out 25.175 megahertz which is the VGA clock. So the reset delay is going to be, has to have a, a name, because all modules have to have names. It has an input, and we're going to use dot notation here. Dot notation says that the, the value following the dot is the internal name of the signal for the module. The value in parentheses after that is the external signal that you're going to connect to the module. So the internal clock is going to be connected to clock 50, the external signal. And the I here means in Thoracic jargon means it's an input. So that's an input to the module. And then there's going to be an output from the module. 
reset, which is going to go to DLY R R S T. We'll figure out where that hooks up in a moment. <coughs> so then the audio VGA audio PLL is going to have a parameter list, is going to have an I.O. list. And you can, by the way, the source code for these is supplied. You can go look at the at the Verilog for each of these uh, in the project directories. And you can hack on them if you want. They're generated, this one is generated by the Mega Wizard. And so you would open it, uh, you would actually open it and modify it using the Mega Wizard because you don't want to look at the Verilog directly. So if you were to pull down the Tools menu, visualize if you will, you pull down the Tools menu, you open the Mega Wizard, you ask, you have two choices, a new module or edit a module. If you ask to edit a module, it'll give you a list of all the modules in the, in the top directory. You can search for the one you want. If you open up a PLL module, it will show you the I.O. connections for the PLL and all of the internal state for the phase lock loop that you are designing. Very handy. Fairly straightforward. There's a line called A reset which uh, takes the delay reset output from the reset module there is a in clock 0 which takes the clock 27 There is a, now this doesn't follow the Jurassic naming convention of inputs and outputs because it's generated by the mega manager, the, the, uh, yeah, the mega wizard. And so these are the names that Altera chose for the, for the module. Dot clock zero output, which is going to be VGA. C T L C L K, ah, the VGA control clock. That's useful. And a C1 clock, which is going to be connected to the audio control clock. And a dot C2, which is the VGA clock. The VGA controller has a whole pile of inputs and outputs. The VGA controller is a Jurassic written module and as I said last time I think there is a couple of, if they're not bugs, they're at least uh, poor design decisions because the, the module as written that comes from Jurassic requires a zero transmission time between when the module specifies an address and when it expects data back to be displayed. That's a bad thing. Because it says do it instantaneously. Nothing happens instantaneously. So the module, the VGA control module that Schuyler Schneider wrote last semester and which is linked in lab one is probably the one you should use and correctly buffers the outgoing address and times it correctly for a one cycle delay for data coming back or a two cycle delay, I forget which. So you probably want to use that. VGA controller, 
called U1 here. It's going to have an interface which is big. It turns out the VGA controller as implemented has a cursor control. So it has a non-destructive cursor that you can place on the screen. But I'm disabling it. And we're just going to set this to four binary 0111, which disables it. There's going to be an output, which we're going to use quite a lot. COO output COORD underscore X. And this is going to be connected to COORD underscore X. <coughs> Another output is going to be CORDY, which is going to be connected to CORDY. So these are the outputs from the VGA model module, which tell memory what pixel needs to be displayed. So these are going to be used to generate a memory address which will then feed back the color data necessary to be displayed at that address. So the very next thing then are the inputs which are going to be I red not to be confused with red eye and <laughs> MVGA underscore red. So this is the internal signal and the signal our memory is going to generate is going to be me memory signal VGA red. There's going to be an input for green, I green from M V V V G A green I have a question. Okay. Blue from M V G A blue. And there's got to be a couple of signals coming out from the VGA model module which go directly to the hardware interface that, that is into which you plug the VGA monitor. So there's going to be an output from VGA red which gets VGA red there's ah yes, O O VGA green output VGA blue which again this goes to the plug, this goes to the monitor <coughs> There's also an output VGA H sync, which does about what you'd expect, and an output VGA V sync, and a couple of other control signals. I'm not going to write, but these are all these are all con connected. Well, these are the internal signals. The external signals are VGA, HS, and VGA, VS. Going out to the to the monitor. So the module generates these signals. It expects these back from your logic. So these are the signals from the module to your logic. These are the signals coming back from your logic to the module. These are the signals from the module that go directly to the hardware interface out to the purple plug. Alright. Oh, I should say 
that there is a very nice utility that you can incorporate into any of your designs which is a logic analyzer. So there is a logic analyzer that you can implement on the FPGA which then monitors the FPGA. And, yes? Sorry. So the bug you were talking about earlier is that uh, the controller gives you a coordinate uh, but it doesn't give you time to fetch the values from memory? That's correct. And, and Scott, yeah, er, uh, so Skyler's, I, I think it was because it was originally designed to use M4K blocks which are quite fast. But uh, Skyler's code correctly does this so that you can use static RAM and get the right pixel in the right location. Otherwise, you're one pixel off, which is disturbing when you're when you care about the ends of the of the array, which you do for this lab. So there's a logic analyzer. Oh, what's the name of it? So one of the other tools. Signal tap, thank you. My brain's melting. And uh, you can implement you can you can instantiate a signal tap interface to your design. It adds hardware, which means it adds size to the design. It also slows down the compilation, but on the other hand, you can record signals and they come out through the JTAG interface and back onto the PC and you see it as a waveform analysis on on the screen of the PC. It can be very nice. Okay, so the next thing then is to implement the static RAM controls. And we're going to do this asynchronously because static RAM is asynchronous. So we're going to assign SRAM address as address register. We're going to assign SRAM DQ. This is the data bus, input output bus. Well, what happens here depends on the value of the write enable. If the write enable is high, it means we are not writing memory because write enable is active low. If we're not writing memory, then the memory is going to provide the data for the bus and so the FPGA should float the bus. And so the value here is going to be 16 tick hexadecimal Z, 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 Z. In other words, it's been tri-stated. This works because these are I.O. pins which have tri-state drivers. Only the I.O. pins on this FPGA have tri-state drivers. If write enable is low, then the FPGA must be supplying the data because it's writing SRAM. And so, And of course, we're going to assign SRAM WE underscore N is equal to right enable. Then we're going to parse the data coming back out of SRAM into the signals necessary to put into the VGA module by, assign, by doing an assign like this where MVGAR well okay so what do we need here we need we need 10 bits it's got to be a 10-bit value because the VGA DAX 
are all 10 bits. So these are all 10 bits. And the encoding I used here was the simplest possible thing I could think of, which is not very efficient, is that the 16-bit word that's coming back out of, out of SRAM has four bits of red, four bits of green, four bits of blue, and four bits of don't care. Clearly, for this application, that's overkill. Because all we really need is a binary color, but this allows you to do 12-bit full color. So, SRAM underscore DQ bits 15 down to 12 concatenated with 6 bits of binary 0 will be the red. So what would have happened if I had reversed this and this? I'd still have 10 bits. I'm getting 4 bits from here. 12, 13, 14, 15. 6 bits from here, so I have a total of 10 bits. What would have why did I put this as the lower order bits and not the high order bits? I wanted it to be bright, exactly. If I put the six, or six bits up here, we'd have a very, very dim full color image. But right with, with the high order bits, we have a bright image. And of course, we have to do this for MVGA green, which is going to be SRAM DQ 11 down to 8 and blue which is 7 down to 4. Ah, as an aside, clearly the curly brackets represent a, con a bit concatenation operator. So the way, you, the way you concatenate bits in Verilog is with curly brackets and the bit streams are, are separated with a comma. Oh, and then we need to do an assign. It could be in any order. So I'm putting it at the top, but you can put it at the bottom. Because order doesn't matter, because all these assigns happen simultaneously. This is the parallel program, because every assign is a wire or a bus. We're going to assign reset to be not key zero. The push buttons are active high. They're no, they're active. Sorry, they're active low. They're 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 low when you push them, but I like to think in terms of positive logic. So I just flip the the sense of the logic there. So at this point now, we're going to update the temporary bit for the shift registers, X, they call it X low bit, and I looked up at uh, well, I actually used a book rather than Google to find out the bit values I needed because um, I happen to know that there's a really nice table of shift register bits in uh, um, 
The Art of Electronics by Horowitz and Hill, a, a very interesting book. X Rand bit 27 gets XORed with X Rand bit 30. It becomes the new no, the new low bit. Remember that in this language, the up caret is XOR and not power like it is in MATLAB. So it's more similar to C in that regard. Y Rand 26 XORed with Y Rand 28. So this calculates the new bit, but the new bit is not going to be shifted in to the shift register except on a clock edge, and we haven't written the clock edge piece of this yet. We haven't written the, the register update part of it yet. But we're going to real soon. <clears throat> like now, I guess. Always at pause edge of V, G, A, C, T, L clock. And it is important to use the same clock as the VGA controller when you're updating memory state because if the clock is not phase locked, sooner or later, you're going to get in a state where you read the wrong memory for a given address output from the VGA controller. So you have to use a clock which is phase locked to the VGA clock and so this was a handy clock to use. So in this always block, which is going to be hundreds of lines long, there's going to be three sections. There's going to be a reset section. There is going to be a what happens during sync section. And there's going to be what happens during normal VGA display section. So the first section is going to be if reset so if the if the ever so slow human has pushed the reset button and how fast can you push a reset how fast can you push a button if you push down on a button how fast can you then release it what do you think how fast are you? That sounds reasonable. 200 milliseconds, probably a good round number. Just for comparison, there's a, there's a, there's a competition which could only happen in the United States, which is called a, a quick draw competition, where you, you start out like this, you pull your 357, you fire on a target, you put it back in your holster for time, right? Who else would think of that? And um, the world champion quick draw artist does that operation, draws, fires on target, puts it back in his holster in 80 milliseconds. Carumba. Normal humans can't do that, however. 200 milliseconds is a reasonable number. That means, since the screen update is about 16 milliseconds, you have to go completely through memory to do a screen update that by the time you press and release you can use that as a signal to clear the whole memory because that is longer than one display time 
And so all you have to do to clear memory, in other words, put, make the screen black, is to do an address register non-blocking gets the value of COOD underscore X 9 down to 1. I'll explain that in a minute. Concatenated with, whoops, that's a concatenation operator. <clears throat> I have trouble, by the way, seeing the difference between that parenthesis and this parenthesis on the screen because it's only three pixels difference. And my vision is not three pixels good anymore. So I'm, I tend to use a large font. Nine down to one. So that's a 18-bit address, sure enough, right? Nine plus nine bits is 18 bits. But I'm only updating the address on every other coordinate. In other words, when the zero bit changes, I'm not changing the updated address. The effect of that is to lower the resolution from 640 by 480 to 320 by 240. Because I'm duplicating a pixel, the even coordinate is the same as the odd coordinate, the even coordinate and Y is the same as the odd coordinate, and so I get a little square instead of a single pixel. So this is a cheesy way of, of generating a lower resolution raster easily. We set the right enable equal to one binary zero. That enables the right. And we set the data register to 16 tick binary zero. So We've set the data register to black. All the bits are off. We've set the write enable to be enabled. As long as you hold down the button, the VGA adapter goes through all the addresses and clears all of memory. And so you get a black screen. If you could manage to twitch your finger enough to, to, to hold the button down for less than 16 milliseconds, 60 mil 16 milliseconds, then you would see only a partially uh, erased screen. It'll never happen. I won't say that it'll happen because somebody will say, see, I did it. I, you, can, you, could, you could say the strangest things in class and there'll be somebody who has a different brain. Nobody ever sees aliasing. Nobody ever sees the wagon wheels go backwards unless it's on film, right? Wrong. People see that. I've, I've met at least one person who's, who has time aliasing in their eyes. But your eye isn't a sample data system. Is it? Or is it? Huh. Turns out it is. We also need to initialize XRAND to anything that is not zero. Because if you have a zero loaded feedback register that's XORing, you always get zero and you never change state. And so we have to initialize it to any non zero value. One is, is perfectly sufficient. YRAND gets initialized any 29-bit value. Oh, I don't know, five. Uh, let's make it hex, hex five, 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 five. And we're going to initialize the walker, the position on the screen that is going to be is going to simulate diffusion to just a little off center. So at 320 by 240 
The horizontal direction center is uh, 160, so let's set this to 9 tick D155. And we'll set the Y walker to the Y coordinate to 9D. 240, 120, let's make it, uh, let's make it 120. So it's just a little to the left of the center of screen is where we're going to release the first walker. And we need to set the state of the state machine equal to a knit. And then we end. That is to say we're ending the reset clause. <clears throat> yeah? But but the VGA increments that. The VGA controller increments this continuously. All right. And as long as you're holding down the reset button, the reset stays true. And so it enters this over and over again, this state over and over again. Millions of times. It is a level. It's not an edge. That is correct. As long as the button is pushed down, it stays high. And so you go back through this state uh, as fast as the clock is running. So since this is in a clocked block, every time the VGA control clock goes high, you detect that the reset line is still high. You do this again. So 25 million times a second you execute this block, which means it only takes uh, something like uh, a hundredth of a second to clear memory, less than one, one frame. And we'll continue next time. But it may be moot because you will have already written a version of the code by then. So, any last questions before lab? What I'm going to do is I'm going to go eat lunch, and then I'll probably wander down the lab by 1 o'clock. I'll open up by 1. But we won't formally start until 1.30, unless everybody's there. No questions? What a quiet group. Yes? You can leave whenever you want to. You just have to be done by next Friday at 2.55 when you leave. All right, so you can leave. You, you don't have to come to class. Well, if you don't come to lab, if you don't come to lab at all, then, then uh, Darwin is going to be keeping little notes saying, where is this person? And it'll, it, will, it will count against you. But if you, have a, if, you have, if you have a scheduled academic conflict, like another class at a certain time, then we just assume that you will put in the time necessary to get the work done. Okay? What else? See you in an hour. <laughs>